Hi guys, so welcome again. Um, today we're gonna switch it up just a little bit. So I decided that I have been neglecting integrated science for a little while, um, especially the paper two, right? Now CXE sent out um a list or you know broad topics that would be coming for the exam. So I guess all of you would have it. Um. The topics are health and sanitation, electricity and lighting, um, conservation of energy, metals and non-metals, terrestrial environments, water and aquatic environments, and fossil fuel and alternative sources of energy. So these are the topics that you have to focus on um, for the paper too. Right? But please remember, even though they sent out this broad list, not just for integrated science, but all of the subjects, you still have to know everything or have an understanding of everything for the paper one, because everything would be basically up for grabs on the paper one. Right. So today's revision, um, I want to dedicate to integrated science and looking at these topics for the integrated science um, paper too. So what we'll be doing in this session is health and sanitation, electricity and lighting, and conservation of energy. So this is going to be past the 10 minutes, like most of the videos are, right? But um, before we dive into it, I just want to put this out there, maybe as a disclaimer or something, but we are going to do or discuss the topics, but it is a very generalized revision. So we aren't going to be touching on every single aspect according to um how the syllabus is set up and all of the information that we have right one because it would be a lot um two that would sort of go into full-on lessons and this isn't lessons per se quote unquote it's just you know a free revision that i'm doing and will be posting on the um, channel so as i said very generalized um, so if you notice some of the things are missing or you're like, but we she didn't talk about this, I did it deliberately, right? So we're talking about most of the main points, which I think I did pull out and touch on. And I really, really do hope that this revision helps you in some form or fashion. So we're discussing um, the topics and then... Um, I don't think that will be in this video. I'll probably make a part two for this particular video, doing some past paper questions based on each of these topics here. Um, maybe just one or maybe two of each, but not much. And we'll just be applying what we learned to the paper. Okay? So the first thing we're going to start with, health and sanitation. So good personal and community hygiene. Good hygiene, you must have good hygiene, you must take care of your environment, take care of your community, use recycling bins, all of these things. You're accustomed here and you know what this is, right? So if we had to give a definition for what hygiene is, so you're asked, what is hygiene? Well, we would say that hygiene is a practice of maintaining health and preventing disease through cleanliness. Cleanliness being that main part of hygiene. Now, where can we practice hygiene? It could be something that is personal. So it's one's responsibility to take care or practice good hygiene for his or herself. And it's also one's responsibility and everyone in the community, um, their responsibility to ensure that they practice good community hygiene. Now, what do we mean by that or what are some examples? For example, um, personal hygiene, simple things, keeping yourself groomed, washing your hands after you use the bathroom, bathing, brushing your teeth. Um, when it comes to 
if you're cooking at home or you're selling food, you want to make sure that you clean all surfaces before and after you prepare any food because you don't want to prepare food on a contaminated or a dirty surface, right? Then you're putting people's health at risk. You want to remove the litter or just not litter at all. Call out people for littering because when you litter, you may not be affected by it because you are moving from that environment. You came there to lime or to, you know, have a spend a few hours or something. But the persons that use this space, one, it's going to be disgusting. You have to look for areas where it doesn't have the garbage for you to feel comfortable. And then that brings us to the next point, which is removing any areas that can breed that can't be, sorry, breeding grubs or pests. So litter like bottles, plastic bags, all of these things, they are breeding grounds for these pests. So for example, if we're talking about mosquitoes, the mosquitoes um, lay their eggs in clean stagnant water, in plastic bottles or even in glass bottles that are left there as litter. Um, if it catches water, that water is going to be stagnant. And these mosquitoes can lay their eggs there. And that's going to affect persons in the community because you may not be there, as I said before. You could be living Mearo and you're going to town, or you're from town and you go to Mearo and you know you're having a good time. And then you leave your things there. It's the persons in the community that are going to feel the brunt of the littering that you did. So remove your garbage when you go in. So we continue now with waste. What exactly is waste? Well, First off, we have different types of waste, right? We have domestic waste, so that will be things from your home, um, whether it be um, biodegradable or non-biodegradable material, industrial waste, so waste from um, manufacturing, um, well, manufacturing areas, or whether it be like gases or things that they're actually physically disposing of, and we have biological waste. So biological waste brings us to this point here, which is sewage. So a waste typically is anything that is not useful for the org to the organism. So we don't want that, right? Now, in the biological aspect, waste is anything that we get rid of um, in terms of the body, right? So with this what we're talking about here. We're talking about getting rid of the removal of urine and feces from the body, and this is categorized as sewage. Now, why do we need to carefully dispose of this sewage? We need to do that because sewage could cause or have be potential threats to person's health, right? Because it could cause infections as you have harmful microorganisms that feed on these excrements. You also have insects that would lay their eggs in the sewage. And if we don't dispose of the sewage properly, there is chances that the sewage could get into water systems. The sewage, which has harmful microorganisms, plus all of the eggs, most of them which might be a bit dormant until they... Um, get into you or they get into some sort of environment where they can hatch this could be a great potential threat to one's health now the next thing is i'm sure you oops sorry i'm sure you've seen it before you're passing um let's say you're passing a pond or something and you notice there's a lot of algal growth on the surface of the pond this is what we call eutrophication and this is caused by having um, a bountiful amount of nutrients that has been released into the water. So we know eutrophication could happen due to runoff from um, certain chemicals that farmers would spray on their crops. And with this case here, where we're talking about sewage, right? So eutrophication is harmful to the organisms that live in such environments because that growth is going to be blocking, one, the sunlight. So the plants that live under the water, they need sunlight for photosynthesis. They wouldn't be able to do that without the sunlight. Two, it's going to be absorbing or taking oxygen from the water while 
um, blocking any oxygen from being dissolved into the water. So now we have this area that is filled or has a higher concentration of carbon dioxide, which the organisms there cannot use, right? So if the area is closed off and there's not space where, let's say, the fishes and the snails and all of that can move from one area to the next, if it's closed, then that could cause the death of all of the organisms that live in such an environment or live in that space. So if you can just throw it here and there, where should the sewage be sent? So this is why we have developed these sewage treatment plants where the sewage is carried to these spaces. It is removed or all of the harmful substances are removed from it. And then what remains is broken down into different components that can be useful and used, for example, as organic fertilizers. And the water from these sewage treatment plants, um, they are filtered, they are cleansed, and they are sent out um, into the environment because it's now cleaned or purified and wouldn't cause any threats. So what's the best way that we can reduce wastage? And that comes with the three R's, which we've been singing since primary school. We know about the different color bins, the red, the yellow, the green, the blue, right? And the black. So we know what all of them, um, we should put in all of them. And the three R's being the reduce, reuse, and recycle. If we can reduce the use or avoid using certain things, we'll do that. If we have to use it, then we could figure out ways that we can reuse these um products or these bottles, the plastic bags, the um, plastic containers. And Caribbean people, we I think we have mastered that. We Everybody's house has a bag of bags, right? So we save these bags and we reuse it. We save the, um, the ice cream containers and we reuse that to send food for family or friends or even to store things in the fridge. And then recycling when we're throwing out the garbage, if we set aside certain things, for example, the plastic bottles, the glass bottles, all of these things to carry to respective areas where they can be recycled and reused, then that is going to prevent the excessive um, filling of these landfills, right? And that would eventually lead to a better good for the environment. As again, these products are not biodegradable. Now, the biodegradable material, we don't even need to throw that away. We can use that and create a compost heap in which we'll get really, really good organic um, fertilizer for our plants. Right? So the next thing is household pests and parasites. So again, definitions. What is a parasite? A parasite is an organism that lives in or on another organism. And that organism is usually called the host. So this parasite, what it does, it gains its nutrients from the host while causing it harm. So if you could recall the different types of feeding relationships that we have, we know that this is an example of a parasitic feeding relationship. Right? I am gaining while what I am feeding off of is losing. So what are some examples of parasites? We have like the tapeworm that we'd find in the small intestines. We have mosquitoes. We have fleas. We have lice. Those are just some examples. You can decide whichever different ones that you feel comfortable using. Next, what is a pathogen? Well, a pathogen is a microorganism that causes diseases. And pathogens could fall into either of four categories. So it could be a bacteria, it could be a protist, it could be a virus, or it could be a fungi. Now, these pathogens, they then fall in line here with these vectors. They are linked because the vectors are like the Uber or the transport vehicles for these pathogens. They carry the pathogens, sometimes unknowingly or most times unknowingly, right? They carry these pathogens, which basically hijack a ride or a lift on them and carry them to their potential hosts without actually causing any harm 
to themselves. So the vector, for example, the mosquito. Mosquitoes carry um, a pathogen, let's say, that causes malaria. The pathogen doesn't do anything to the mosquito. It's just hopping a ride. And when the mosquito bites us to feed, it is actually releasing, or that is where the pathogen would then hop off and be like, yeah, thanks for the ride. And then enter into us, which will be the host, and cause harm to us. So the person who is infected would get the malaria disease. Right? So that's how it works. Parasite, pathogen, and the um, vector. That's what you need to know in terms of the definition. You should be able to distinguish each and what rules they play. Then what is a pest? So we usually say, you know, a sibling is a pest or somebody bothering you, they are pests, right? So it is sort of in line with that. You know, somebody's bothering you, right? It's destructive. So a pest is a destructive insect or animal in some cases that can carry and spread disease-causing organisms. So the pest itself isn't what is getting you sick. It is what it is carrying that causes the disease. And remember, we just said what that is. It's a pathogen, right? So some examples of pests or common household pests are rats, roaches, mice, mosquitoes. We have like ants, all of these different things. So then how do we keep them away? We don't want pests around us, so what should we do to keep them away? Well, proper hygiene comes into place here. So proper hygiene practices in the home as well as the community. And why do we stress on keeping the community clean as well? Is because I could keep my house as clean as possible, but if I am living in an area where the persons have no respect for the community, or I am keeping my house clean, but when I go outside... Um, a litter bug. I don't care because this is not inside my house. I am adding to the creation of these breeding grounds for the pests. And the pests are going to come into my home because my house has food, right? Food, it has dark corners, it has warm spaces where they can freely reproduce. There are no um, predators in my home as well. So I am inviting them to my home if I do not practice proper hygiene, right? Both in the home and the community. And apart from that, sometimes we just can't get um, rid or can't get past or avoid some of these pests. So then we come into different means that we can use. So we can use things like chemical barriers as well as um, physical barriers, right? Physical barriers, for example, let's say um, flies or mosquitoes. We have the screens that we can put up um, on the inside of the, well, the outside of the um, window, right? So when we open our windows, we'll still be able to get breeze, but there's that mesh that keeps the insects or the pests out. Um, we also have the sticky traps for flies. So you put a little food on it and they will go towards that and they'll be stuck there. And we have the mouse traps. All of these things are physical. Chemical will come in um, like the the poisons that you'd put around the house and the corners for the, right, um, the mice and uh, um, bop, right? The almighty bop or Protox or whichever brand that you use. But that is chemical means in which we can get rid or control these pests. Now, apart from that, we have different methods that we can use to control these pests, right? So, we have, we're looking at two here, and then we'll look at some other um, means. So we have mosquitoes and we have the house flies. Those two are specified in the syllabus. Um, you had to know the life cycle of these because knowing the life cycle of pests gives you a good understanding or a good hint as to how we can get rid of this, right? At which stage? We can use what means, whether physical or chemical barriers, or understanding where they lay their eggs so we can get rid or dispose of such um, materials or such areas that might be in the yard or in the community, right? So these here, 
Um, these pictures show the life cycle of the mosquito and the fly, which is very common or very similar, sorry. And we should be acquainted with this because I think since primary school, we've been learning about the life cycle of at least the mosquito, if not the house fly. Now, there are other means that could be used to get rid of these things. And it's based on their life cycle, understanding it. So we have the eggs, the eggs then um, hatch and turn into the larvae. Then we have the pupa, then we have the adult images. And again, it's the same thing for the mosquito, um, sorry, the house fly, right? So looking at the life cycle, we have different stages here or different things that we can do at a particular stage. So at the, if we're using anti-larval measures, right, we don't want this here, then we can look at environmental control, chemical control, or biological control, right? Environmental control, looking at the environment, looking at the spaces where the mosquito would lay their eggs, where the larvae would live, we get rid of these areas. Chemical control, um, we can use sprays, um, we can also add certain things if we know we have to have um, sources of water that is continuously open, then we use certain chemicals that wouldn't affect the other organisms that are living in the um, those water sources, but it would get rid of the mosquitoes. And biological control, biological control is where we're using another living organism to get rid of um to get rid of this pest, right? So we add fishes or certain types of fishes to the pond that feed specifically on the mosquitoes, whether it be on the eggs or the larvae. Then we have anti-adult measures where we can um, use space sprays, um, residual sprays, or even genetic control. So here we're talking about some lab stuff that we can even do. Um, protection against mosquito bites. So we have mosquitoes in the environment. We can't do much about that, right? But the mosquitoes, we can use nets, mosquito nets, like what you put around babies. So some adults or um, some persons also sleep with that if they live in areas that has a lot of mosquitoes. We can wear protective clothing. We can use the screens that I mentioned before, um, putting it up at your windows and doors, and also repellents. So there's the off um, that you can spray on your skin. Um, what's this one? The odor mask you can also use. Um, what else? Probably things with citronella in it that keeps mosquitoes away, right? And the last point is legislative control. So this one here is based on like civic laws. Certain laws, certain things can be put into place to ensure that one person do not create breeding grounds for these pests and two, that they have to face um, certain punishments. So um, if you have so this sort of area which is um, leading to forming breeding grounds for these mosquitoes or any of these pests, then you can be fined for having such areas. Now, what are the four main methods of control? So we looked at, um, we mentioned physical and biological already, right? So we have sanitary control, biological, chemical, and also the mechanical control. The physical control will fall under this category here, okay? And that's it for health and sanitation. On to the second topic now, which is electricity and lighting. So I guess at this point, you can take a little pause and then come back into it, okay? But I'll be moving on. So electricity and lighting. Circuits. First thing, we want to know all the definitions. We have to know it, just in case they ask. Because definitions are usually like one mark, sometimes two. We don't want to lose these easy marks because they add up, come into the end, okay? So what is electricity? Electricity is a form of energy resulting from the existence of charged particles, either through static accumulation, which is, you know, the rubbing together of um, two items, or 
uh, the electrical current or electric current. And what is electric current? It's a flow of charged particles along a complete path called an electric circuit connected to an energy source. So what do we know about electric circuits? We know that the circuit must be made of material that is um, conducting, right, material. So it must allow electricity to freely flow through it. Um, the energy source could either be a cell or a battery somewhere where we are going to get that charge that will go, um, then flow through the entire circuit, right? And it must be complete meaning that there must be no open areas um, because if there is an open area there's any area where the circuit is not completed or doesn't flow continuously then the electricity will not be able to pass through the entire thing now what's a unit of current is the ampere and we represent that by capital e um if you're here and the dog is barking in the background or any noise please please ignore it these dogs were quiet they chose to start talking when i have a video to do anyway um so these are the different symbols that we use or we should be familiar with some of them um if not all so we have the cell one short well how i like to say it for you to remember just one short stroke and a long one that is a cell Anytime we have more than one cell, it is a battery. So that is also something that I think you have to pay close attention to because if they ask you to draw a diagram and they specifically said a cell, if I was correct in the paper and you drew a battery for me, I would not give you it correct because that shows that you don't know or you cannot distinguish between a cell and a battery. So just pay close attention to that in case there's people like me correcting your papers, right? But I don't usually mark harder, I just say it's just to make sure that you could distinguish between what a cell is and what a battery is. Um, we don't really need to know the alternative um, for a battery, but mm, these two, right? A cell and a battery. Um, then we have the filament lamp. So we usually use this one here. This is the filament lamp that we have. You just do that a little something there and you draw a circle around it to show that's your bulb. We have the fixed resistors. Um, you can use either one. Um, we have variable resistors. Um, I don't think we use variable resistors for integrated science, so we didn't really have to learn this one, but resistors. And then these at the bottom here, we have to have to know. So this is the ammeter, the voltmeter, the fuse, and also the switch. So without the switch, once the switch is open, then the circuit is not complete. Once it's closed, then we know the circuit is complete. And if we have a bulb attached to it, the bulb will light because the energy or the electricity is flowing throughout the entire um, circuit. So here we have um, some lamps or bulbs, filament lamps, set up in two different ways. And we need to know these different ways that we can set up um, a circuit. Right, so we have parallel and series. So series is one after the next. You can think of like your Netflix shows, how you watch those series one after the next, you don't take a break. And then we have the parallel. So the parallel is exactly what it is, parallel. They are not touching or meeting each other. They are not on the same line or same space. And here we have one above the next, right? So if we were to put a next one, we'd have that here. And well, this is not how to draw it. Don't draw it like me, but I'm just doing that there to, as an example, right? So two things that we need to know. The total current from the source, which is in this case a cell, would be equal to the current flowing through each path, right? This is for the um, parallel. And if there's a break in one path, current can still pass through the other. Again, parallel. So if something happens to my line that I drew here, 
it can still successfully pass through these other two. But if something was to happen at this point here, then neither of these lamps would light because they are in series. So that's the disadvantage of having something in series rather than having it set up in parallel, right? Now, what is voltage? Voltage is the electric potential difference between two points. And it is defined as the work done per unit charge to move a charge between, again, two points. Voltage, we represent that. We say it's capital V, right? Now, what is used to measure this? We looked at these two here, a meter, voltmeter, a meter. We saw amps is the unit of current. So to measure current, we'd have the ammeter. That is what they're measuring here in these um, two diagrams. Here, we want to talk about the voltmeter. So the voltmeter is to measure voltage. And uh, how do we set it up? It is placed in parallel across a component. So we have the ammeter is placed in line with it. But the voltmeter, we would set it up like this, right? So you'd have a circle, a V, and we have that. So that's how we set up voltmeters while ammeters go in line with, um, with the circuit. Now, what is resistance? Resistance, same thing. If you're resisting something, you're opposing it, right? So it's the opposition or resistance to current flow in a circuit. And what's the unit for that? It's the ohm. And the ohm is that, right? Now, there's a formula that we need to know when it comes to electricity, or there's a few formulas, I should say. The first one being the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. Because sometimes you can get, um, let's say you get a question, you know, if to make it very simple, right, you know the current and the resistance, we could find the voltage because voltage is equal to um, current by resistance. But if we have the voltage, we have the current, then we can find resistance. And also, if we have the voltage and we have the current, we can find, um, I think I said that. So if we have voltage and resistance, we can find the current, right? So either one is the same thing that we learned in maths, which is how to change or alternate your um, formula to make it relatable to what you want to figure out what it is we need to figure out so remember that formula v is equal to ir voltage is equal to current by resistance now what is power power is the rate per unit time at which electrical energy is transferred by an electric current what's the unit for that it's the what we represent capital as capital w and a one watt is equal to one joule per second. Now, the formula for this is power is equal to IV, right? And what is DC and AC current? Hmm. DC, AC current. We have DC is direct current, AC is alternative current. So direct current is, as it says, direct from a source. So direct current is current that passes around a circuit in one direction only. So example from a cell or a battery, whereas alternative current is current provided from the mains supply that passes around a circuit in one direction and then in the opposite direction. So alternative right? You're going in one direction and then you're going in the next direction. Direct only in one direction. The next thing, direct current is from a cell or a battery as the examples or alternative current is from the main. So it's from the main supply. Now in most of our appliances that we have home like our refrigerator and all of that, it's a three plug, right? That's what we use here. And when looking at um, the different cores that you find, even if, you know, we're looking at like your phone charger, if it becomes frayed, right? And you're looking and you're seeing the different color wires, you have to know what it means. 
So we have the earth wire, the neutral wire, and the live wire. The live wire is the brown wire, the neutral wire is the blue, and the green wire or the earth wire is the green and yellow. Um, there's a question in the CSEC pass paper. I think I pulled out that one for us to do, but they just represent it as a green, right? So either one you want to put green or green and yellow, that will be correct. Now, in a circuit, we have safety devices that we put. And the main safety device we have and we have to know is the fuse. Now, what is the fuse? It's a safety device, which is a piece of wire that is designed to melt, right? So it's placed in the um, with the wire there, and it is designed to melt if a current larger than a particular value passes through it. So when it melts, that means that the circuit is now incomplete. No electricity can flow to the appliance. So it is there as a safety device or a safety measure to um, save or to protect the equipment for the appliance, right? So that's the first piece there. Now we're on to talking about how to read these analog um, electric meters and calculating the electric bills. First, what is the formula to calculate how much electricity has been used? Energy transferred, the units for that is kilowatt hours, is equal to power in kilowatts. This is very, very important to note. It is kilowatts because sometimes or most of the times in the table that they give you, they give you the power in watts. You have to be very careful and convert that to kilowatts before calculating or figuring out your answer to fill in the missing spots, right? And the time always has to be in hours. So anytime you get the time in minutes or seconds, you have to convert that to hours. So how do we go about reading the analog clock? You start from the far most left, right? And you read going in this direction. Now, if you look at it, the first one will go clockwise, the next one goes anti-clockwise. So you're reading not in this direction, you're reading in this direction here, right? So uh, you're seeing the units. So um, 10,000, 1,000, 100, tens, and ones. So what would be the reading here? We go this way, this is seven. Then this way, this is one. Then we come this way, this is eight. This way, we come all the way around here. This is nine. And then this way, seven, right? So how we read this, because some of them can be very tricky, where the line, oops, why it's not moving, right? So the line, we want it directly on the point or the one that it has just passed or closest to, right? That's where you take your reading. And how do you calculate the cost on the electric bill? You will be given the cost per kilowatt hour. So it's kilo, the cost per kilowatt hour multiplied by the number of kilowatt hours that you have used. And that's how we figure out how much you have to pay on your electric bill. And I think this is the last one for this section here. We have different types of fire extinguishers, right? No. This is the fire triangle here showing you what is needed for a fire to be successfully started. You need to have the fuel, so something to burn. You need to have heat and you need to have oxygen. Without oxygen, then the fire cannot be started. Or without any of these other two components here in the triangle, the fire will not be successfully started. So depending on the source at which the fire has started, you have different types of fire extinguishers that could be used. You have dry powder, you have foam spray, you have water, and you have the carbon dioxide. Um, the, this one is the main one that is usually asked about um, in questions, right? So if we are using a carbon dioxide extinguisher, then what are we trying to get rid of here? With the, in the fire triangle, we're trying to get rid of the 
oxygen. So if we remove the oxygen by filling it or filling in a higher concentration of carbon dioxide, this will team or this will stop the fire. And that's it for electricity and lighting. So as before, you can take a little break at this point because I know I'm probably talking real long by now. But this is the last one for this video, which is conservation of energy. So let's take a peek at this. So energy. We know energy comes in different forms, but we always start off, what's the formula? And, or not the formula, but what's the unit? What is the definition? What is energy? Simple, simple. Energy is your ability to do work right? What is the unit? It's the joule represented by capital G. Now we have different types of energy, but we have two categories in which we can fall under. We have kinetic energy, which is brought about by energy due to movement, and we have potential energy, which is energy that is stored. So it's like you have the potential to be great, but you are not using that potential, right? You have it stored, if you are running, you are moving, you are doing some sort of action where you're using that energy, this is kinetic energy, right? Now, if we come, we're following the breakdown here. They're saying energy comes from moving, right, on this side. And then we have on this side, under potential energy, the energy is stored to be used later. And then in the middle here, we experience energy in different ways. So we have thermal energy thermal heat, mechanical energy, motion here, electrical energy, um, energy of particles moving through a wire. We have magnetic energy, energy causing pulling or pushing. We have, we can experience energy in the form of sound energy, so we can hear it, or light energy. We can be able to detect that with using our eyes. And on this side, with potential forms of energy, we have chemical energy, so stored in like foods and fuels. Um, this is a next question that they ask. So with the um, with the fossil fuels, what type of energy is stored in fossil fuels? It's chemical energy, right? Um, we have elastic energy, energy stored in objects that are stretched. We have nuclear energy, um, which is energy stored in center of particles. And we have gravitational energy, which is energy stored in an object when it is above the Earth's surface. So if we have... Um, something on a table that has gravitational potential energy because it's at a distance off of the floor, right? And we'll see this coming in um, with one of the questions, I think, that I separated for us to do. Now, what is the rule of energy conservation? So this is something that is known. I think all of us should know this. This shouldn't be hard for us to remember that energy cannot be destroyed or created. It can only be converted from one form to the next. So thus, in a system, if the amount of energy put in is not the same that is being exerted by the appliance or the object, that's because energy is being lost. And this is because no system, whether something with human beings or living organisms or um. Um, let's say like machines and all of that that has been created by humans, no system is 100% effective. No system uses uh, energy input and it's being used 100% in the form of energy that we want it to be used, right? We always lose energy in the form of um, some wasteful forms in that particular case. So it's not to say that the form that it is being lost in has no use at all. It just has no use in this particular case. So for example, heat is one of the main ways that we lose a lot of energy, whether a biological system or a mechanical system. Um, sound, that's also our next one, right? Now what is collision? Collision, if we collide, your um, suddenly or forcefully bumping or coming together in the direction contacting two objects. So two things crashing into each other suddenly and very forcefully, that is collision. And we have two different types of collision. We have inelastic collision. This is where I bump into something and neither 
of us move. So let's say we have two cars that crashes head on into each other. It comes to a complete stop. And then we have elastic collision. Let's say we have um, some, what do you call that? Um, pool. We're playing pool and we have the balls, right? And it bumps into the next one. And the two of them pitch going in different directions or opposite directions. That's elastic collision there. So once we collide, we bounce apart and go in the other or opposite direction. Now, how is energy transferred in a wave, right? So we have pulse and we have wave trains. A pulse is a single or short-lived motion, whereas a wave train is something that is continuous. So we have a continuous group of waves. And what's the different types of waves? We have transverse and longitudinal waves. So we have C and D. Right, so C is this here showing us the transverse wave train, and we have D showing us the longitudinal wave train. So, transverse wave trains it's known by its crests and troughs. Right, you have this is an experiment that you can do. So, you have a fixed end, and then you have your hand doing some sort of motion. So, with this one here to get the transverse wave train, you move your hand left and right continuously because remember it's a wave train, a continuous group of waves. If it was just a pulse, it would be one movement left and right, right? But this year we have the wave train and you're seeing the very evident crests and troughs. So, the crests would be high points as you're seeing the arrows going, and troughs would be the base here, right? And then we have the longitudinal wave trains, which are recognized by their compressions and refractions. We're seeing it's caused by a push and pull of the hand in a repeated movement. Again, it's a wave train. And we have our refractions and we have the compressions. So the compressions are the points where the coils are very close together. The refractions are where they are separated. Now, what is momentum? Momentum is the quantity of movement or, sorry, quantity of motion that an object has. And how do we calculate this? Momentum, we use a common P to represent this, right? And momentum, the units, is um, kilograms meter per second. So this per second, you can write it as minus one or you can have kilogram meters and you put the slash here per second, either way you prefer to write it, okay? So the formula is momentum is equal to mass, um, which is m, common m, in kilograms multiplied by velocity, which is common v in meters per second. I forgot to put the minus sign. So meters per second, right? What is velocity? It is... Um, movement in a particular direction. So speed has no direction, right? Whereas velocity, you're moving at a speed in this particular direction or you're moving at a pace in this particular direction. So that's what velocity is. Now, what does the law of conservation of linear momentum state? It states that in a closed system, the total momentum before collision is equal to the total momentum after collision. So once you have no external forces being added into this system, then you will have no change in the total momentum before or after the collision. And that is it for the first three topics, right? So what we'll be doing next, um, we'll do the, well, I'll post a video about the questions that are linked to this three topics that we did here. And then the next video with the um, rest of topics, we'll finish that off. We'll look at metals and non-metals, and then terrestrial environments, water and aquatic environments, and last but not least, fossil fuels and alternative sources of energy.